Welcome back. Today we'll be discussing conditional probability, which concerns situations in which we have some extra information that can change our understanding of how likely something is to happen. We'll need to start with some new notation. We read this expression as the probability of A given B, which means the probability of A assuming we already know that B is the case. For example, roll a die. We know, of course, that the probability of rolling a 6 is 1 in 6, but the probability of 6 given that we know the result is even is a different story altogether. It may help to imagine that I've rolled a die and asked you to guess how likely it is that I've rolled a 6. But before you guess, I give you some extra information. The result is definitely even. In that case, you know that I didn't roll a 1, a 3, or a 5. There are in fact only three possible even numbers I could have rolled, so the probability will have a denominator of three. Of the three even numbers, only one is a six, so the probability of a six, given that the result is even, is one-third. Now let's reverse the six and the even and consider the probability of rolling an even number, given that the result is six. This is rather different and rather obvious. If we know that the roll was a six, then there's no uncertainty at all. Six is definitely even. Therefore, this probability is 1. Let's do another example. Draw a card. First, let's find the probability of drawing a black card, given that the card is a king. Well, we know we have a king, and that there are only four of them. And among those four kings, only two are black. So this probability is 1 in 2. In contrast, if we consider the probability of drawing a king, given that the card is black, then the relevant background fact is that there are 26 black cards, of which only two are kings. So this probability is only 1 in 13. As you've now seen a couple of times, the probability of A given B is not the same thing in general as the probability of B given A. Be sure to keep the meaning of the notation straight in your head. Doing this will help you as we move into a new type of problem, which I'll introduce in the context of medical tests medical tests in particular, in which the result is either positive for some condition or negative for the condition. We could be talking about a test for a disease, or a genetic predisposition for a disease, or a pregnancy test, or even a drug test. One thing to bear in mind about such tests is that while they may be very accurate, they're never perfectly accurate. There are such things, after all, as false positives and false negatives, when the result of the test does not reflect the underlying reality. Here's an example. The test came back negative. You're not pregnant. This woman is quite obviously pregnant, so this would be a clear instance of a false negative. In contrast, we have this situation. The test came back positive. You're pregnant. This, even more obviously, is a false positive. With this in mind, let's do a new type of problem. Consider a test for a certain disease. When taken by someone who has the disease, it gives the correct result 97% of the time. When taken by someone who doesn't have the disease, it gives the correct result 98% of the time. So this looks like a very accurate test. As part of a routine checkup, you take the test. You anxiously await the results, and the verdict is positive. You've tested positive for the disease. Now the question is, what's the probability that you actually have the disease? the most common response is 0.97. This, however, is incorrect. We can see why it's incorrect by translating some of the statements on the screen into conditional probabilities. Let's go back to our first bullet point. Translated into our new notation, it looks like this. The probability that the test is positive, given that the person taking it has the disease, is 0.97. In contrast, the question we've been posed is, probability of disease given a positive test. When expressed symbolically like this, it becomes clear that these are two different probabilities. Jumping to the conclusion that there's a 97% chance that we have the disease is therefore unwise to put it mildly. While we're here, let's go ahead and translate the second bullet point into a conditional probability statement. The probability that the test is negative given that the person taking it does not have the disease is 0.98. Okay, we've practiced translating statements into the notation of conditional probability, but the question remains, we've tested positive. How likely is it that we actually have the disease? 
And here I'll make a confession. I haven't given you enough information to answer that question. One more piece of information will suffice, though. We need to know how common the disease is in the general population. Let's suppose in this case that the disease affects 1% of the general population. Now we have enough information to solve our problem. Before we do so, pause the video for a moment and try to guess roughly what the answer will be. Most people guess that the probability of having the disease, given the positive test, is somewhere between 95 and 99%. To find the actual answer, we'll need a new technique that I'm about to show you. We ultimately want to know whether you have the disease or not. Now, you're just one of many people who took this test, so we want to view this in a wider context. Consider the probability that a randomly chosen person has the disease. This, we were told, is 1%. Consequently, the probability that a randomly chosen person doesn't have it is 99%. If someone who has the disease takes the test, there are two possible outcomes. And we know that the probability of a positive for such a person is 0.97. That, of course, means that the probability of a negative for such a person is 0.03. Similarly, if someone who doesn't have the disease takes the test, there are the usual two outcomes, and we're told that for such a person, the result is negative 98% of the time, which means that it will be positive 2% of the time. Let's imagine a long line of people being given this test. Some of these people will go along each of the possible paths on the tree. The probability that a given person goes along the top path is 0.01 times 0.97, which is 0 0.0097. The probability of going along each of the other three paths is computed similarly, and I'll put the results up all at once. These numbers give us the percentages of the population in our line that end up going along each path. To make this easier to grasp, it helps to think of a specific number of people in our vast line. I'll consider 10,000 people, since this will make the numbers that follow come out nice, as you'll see. So, for every 10,000 people who take the test, we should expect 97 to go along the top path. Why 97? Because 0 0.0097 of 10,000 is 97. We just moved the decimal place over by four positions. Now, who are these 97 people? They tested positive, as they should have, because they do have the disease. So these are 97 true positives. Next, of the 10,000 people in line, we should expect just three to go along the next path. Again, because 0 0.0003 of the 10,000 is 3. These three people tested negative, but they shouldn't have since they do have the disease. Thus, these are three false negatives. Continuing on this way, we see that of every 10,000 people, we expect 198 people to have no disease, yet test positive. That is, we expect 198 false positives. We also expect 9,702 of the people, the vast majority, to not have the disease, and for the test to say so. That is, of every 10,000 people, we expect 9,702 true negatives. We're now in a good position to answer our question. What's the probability of actually having the disease given a positive test result? The key is to remember that this is a conditional probability. We know something we know that we've selected someone who tested positive. So we're not dealing with the full line of 10,000 people. We know we've got someone in one of these two groups. Thus, when we compute our probability, the denominator will consist only of these people, since these are the people who tested positive. Of those people, how many actually have the disease? Only the true positives, of whom there are 97. So 97 goes upstairs since those are the people who tested positive and actually have the disease. When you run this through your calculator, you'll find that it comes out to about 0.33. If you, like most people, thought that this probability should be around 95% or higher, you should be astonished. What looked initially like certain doom now doesn't look quite so bad. Sure, there's still a 1 in 3 chance that you have the disease, but there's a 2 in 3 chance that you don't. Probability, as this example shows, can be highly counterintuitive. Here we had a test that sounded remarkably accurate. 97 and 98% chances of giving the correct results to people with and without the disease. And yet we found that only 1 in 3 people who test positive actually have the disease. How on earth did that happen? 
I'll try to give you an intuitive explanation. We knew we were dealing with an instance of a positive test. So let's imagine a big box into which we'll put all those people who test positive. Don't worry, it is a very comfortable box. The box of positives starts out empty. Now, instead of having everyone line up to take the test, let's separate them out, at least in our mind's eye, into two groups. One is a huge crowd. These are the people who don't have the disease, and they make up 99% of the whole population. The other group is much smaller. These are the people who do have the disease. Now, we give everyone the test and think about who goes into the box. In a big crowd, almost everyone, 98% of them, test negative, but a small percentage, 2% of them, do test positive, so they go in the box. In the small group, almost everyone, 97% of them, tests positive, so almost all of them go in the box. Well, who's in the box? A small percentage of the large group and a large percentage of the small group. And of course, a small percentage of a large group can easily outnumber a large percentage of a small group. And that is why most of the positives turned out to be false positives. The technique that we used to solve our medical test problem actually works under much broader circumstances. In fact, the process we used in that problem often comes in handy when we know the probability of A given B, but we want the probability of B given A. To see this, let's do another example which has nothing to do with medical testing. Suppose I have two pennies in my pocket. One is an ordinary penny, but the other is a trick penny with heads on both sides. If I pull one out at random, there's a 50% chance that I'll get the ordinary penny. Suppose, however, that I pull one out at random, and then, without examining it, I flip it 20 times. Well, if I get 20 straight heads, it's pretty certain that I did not pull the ordinary penny. I want to consider, however, a less extreme version of this. Suppose I pull out a coin at random, and I flip it once and get a head. What's the probability that I chose the ordinary coin? It should have come down from 50%, but by how much? Let's begin by translating our question into our new notation for conditional probability. Although it isn't obvious how to find this probability at first, we might take comfort in the fact that we do at least know the reverse probability, the probability of heads given the ordinary coin, which is obviously one half. So, we might be able to make use of our medical test technique to turn this probability around. At any rate, let us try. We want the probability of the ordinary penny given that we got a head. Now our question is, did we draw the ordinary penny or the trick penny? So let's start by putting those two possibilities on a tree. Each time we reach into our pocket to do this experiment, there's a 50% chance that we grab the ordinary penny and a 50% chance that we grab the trick one. If we get the ordinary penny, then we're equally likely to flip heads or tails with it. But if we drew the trick coin, the probability of flipping heads is 1, and the probability of tails is obviously 0. Let's imagine that we repeat this experiment over and over. We can find the probabilities of going down each of the four paths in the usual way by multiplying along the branches. If we do so, we would get the following results. It's easy to find these particular percentages of 100, so let's imagine doing this experiment 100 times. For every 100 times we do this experiment, we should expect 25 instances, that's 25% 25 of 100, in which we go along the top path. That is, 25 instances in which we get heads on the ordinary coin. We should also expect 25 instances of tails on the ordinary coin, and also 50 instances of heads on the trick coin, and of course, no instances of tails on the trick coin. Now we want the probability of getting the ordinary coin given that we flipped a head. So we're not really considering all hundred of these experiments, only the ones in which heads came up. Thus, in the probability we're trying to compute, our denominator is going to be 25 plus 50, since this is the total number of experiments in which heads came up. Well, we're interested in the probability that we drew the ordinary coin. So of these 75 experiments, how many of them involve the ordinary coin? 25. And if you do the arithmetic, you find that the probability we seek is 1 in 3. Thus, after having flipped one head, the probability that we drew the ordinary coin drops from 50% to 33%. Well, that's all for this lecture, and I leave you with penguins.